I don't know what it is today. I, I definitely feel the enemies coming at me because my allergies this morning. I haven't had allergy issues in months. And all of a sudden, sudden this morning, it just, like, it's been crazy. So I apologize in advance if I have to um, wipe my nose or something like that. Um, but let's just pray that devil out of this room. Just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. In the name of Jesus, we just dedicate this altar to you, God. We dedicate this time for you to speak to your children, to your church, to your people. In the name of Jesus, I declare, Lord, that now is your time, oh God. Now is your time to speak. Now is your time to uplift. Now is your time to move in the name of Jesus. We just say, Lord, that this is your place. This is your church. And these are your believers, oh God. And in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would just remove every barrier that is blocking us from being in your presence, from being in your spirit, where you said, abide in me as I abide in you. Lord God, just let this be a time where we come to be in your presence and one with you. In Jesus' mighty name, the, the church say amen. 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 amen, amen. I had a tough time putting this message together. And uh, Pastor Amar just kind of gave a brief uh, introduction as to all of the things that I have to do. I have to be a father, a husband, a, um, a student. I'm working on my MBA currently. And I'm doing my um, four 10-hour days schedule this week. So we have 10-hour days, Monday through Thursday, and then we had Friday off where I took the kiddos out for a fun daddy and kids day. But with all of that said, I had to fit in a message for you all this. And it was like, it was challenging, not in that the material was challenging, or it was the time, finding the time to put something down on paper, to meditate in the word, to get into what the Lord wanted to speak this morning, it was a struggle. And I thought to myself, how many of us are going through that similar struggle where we're so busy with everything that we're doing that we don't often give God the full time that he needs? If I didn't have to preach this Sunday, I probably would have never, I'll be real honest with you guys, I probably would have not opened my Bible this week because I just didn't have the time or the space in my, my meditation to just get in that space. I'm not talking about praying and worshiping. I do that all the time, constantly. But to meditate on his word and to find out what he's speaking to me in that moment, in that week, what he wants to deliver to his church. I might have been too busy to miss what God was saying, too busy to miss his encouragement, too busy with everything else to miss what he was speaking. And I feel like the church is in, in a place where we often find ourselves busy with things other than what we should be focused on. And isn't that how the devil likes to work? Isn't that what he wants to do? Isn't that what the enemy is trying to do? Is trying to steal your focus away from the things of God? Isn't that the whole purpose? So the more you're busy with the things of the world, it could be providing for your family. But in that same thing, you're taking your mind off of the things that God wants you to focus on. There's a constant battle for your mind. There's a constant battle for your attention. There's a constant battle between two forces trying to get your attention. And it's up to you to decide what you give your focus to. The Bible says the enemy will come in like a thief in the night to steal, kill, and destroy. And I was thinking about that. I've, I've thought about this a lot. Why... What would the devil want to steal from me? Does it benefit him anything to steal my finances? Does it benefit him anything for him to steal my possessions? He can't use it. 
Does it benefit him to kill me if I go to heaven? No, it doesn't benefit him. Does it benefit him to destroy my property? No, it doesn't benefit him. But what benefits him is if he steals our attention. Because when he steals your attention, he will kill your ambition. And it's so easy for him to take your attention away from God. It's natural. It's natural for your attention to be given to everything else and to be stolen from God. I'm going to go through a, a beautiful text here, and I'm going to show you exactly how the devil's going to steal your attention and why he wants it and why he wants your kids' attention and why he keeps wanting the next generation and next generation to come. He just wants their focus to kill your ambition. And then what does he do with that? Once your ambition on the things of the Lord is killed, he will destroy the potential that God has put in your life. He destroys it. God has blessed you with a potential. A potential to speak to the masses, to spread the gospel. A potential to bring people to church, to give them the, the good news of the gospel, to to save them for all eternity, to baptize them in water, all of that potential can be destroyed by taking your attention. Nationwide, there's this, since COVID-19 pandemic, there has been decline and decline and decline in church attendance, almost to the point where it's non-existent. It's no longer a routine. It's no longer a staple in our weekly family traditions. It's no longer a time when we can get into the presence of God and just sit and give God our attention for two hours. And now that time that so many churches have established over centuries, that time in our weekly um, routine has been disrupted and now God's reach is limited because our attention is gone somewhere else I really feel in my spirit not just for me but for my family for my church and for all the churches around our country it's time to get back to focus it's time to move back to understand what the enemy has done in this time period, to understand the, the damage that he has done to the, to the very ground that God has established in our weekly pattern, in our weekly routine, to just come sit in the presence of God. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. We are now removed from that experience. Where he says, I'm inhabiting the praises of my people, we are now removed from that experience. So how much can God be limited by our a disruption in our weekly routine? Now, church, there was an article that we were discussing where it says only 30% of millennials in America even belong to a church not just go to a church, but belong to a church. And I wonder after this disruption of our routines through the COVID-19 pandemic, how that affects the next generation after it and the next generation. Do you see where the enemy might be really targeting right now? Is to steal your attention and your position from being in the presence of God But if we take time as a church and within our own family units to dedicate a special space for the Lord, I really believe that we can start turning things around. Amen? Amen. All right. So my main text today is coming out of 2 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to, we're going to keep going until... The Lord tells me to stop. 
So <laughs> I have it going up until verse 26, but we can, we'll see where we go from there. Now, this story is all about the Shunammite family, the Shunammite woman. Now, Elisha was a prophet in this time. And uh, shout out to Elisha who had a birthday this week. He does so much for this church. You guys have no idea. <laughs> that is your son. So starting at verse 8. One day, Elisha went to Shenum. I don't, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. This sounds like every auntie that I know. <laughs> so whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay here whenever he wants. Now, this wasn't their family member. This wasn't, you know, somebody different. They said, let's prepare a room for this man of God. It wasn't that he was doing his ministry out of there. They just knew he would come into town, and they built a room for him. My topic today is from renovation to restoration. Making a room, making a room for the servant of the Lord. It wasn't something that she had to do, but you know how women like their home projects, <laughs> their home renovation. I know how women come up with these ideas to do a home. And she says to her husband, let's, let's make a room. When my wife says it, says, can you make her, can you change the wall? Can you fix this? Can you put up shiplap there? <laughs> That's my experience. But, and every time she says that, it looks so good when it's finished. You women have a great understanding of when it's the right time to make room for the things of the Lord. Amen? So in this physical text, we see a physical home. And they're intentionally making a room for the Lord. They're intentionally making a space for God. Now, let's translate that back into us and into our weekly routines and into our everyday lives. Am I going to actually go into my house and make dedicate a space for the Lord? Is that what we're talking about? Do I need to make my guest room into a room for the Lord? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in your everyday lives to make space for the things of the Lord. To make room. Make room in your routine for God. Make prayer a part of your routine. Make worship a part of your routine. Give God space. Give him space in your family. Give him space in your room. Give him space in your marriage. Give him space at your job. Give him space in your car. Give him space. Give him the room into your lives. We need to acknowledge that what the enemy is trying to do is to decrease the amount of interaction we have with the Holy Spirit. Decrease the amount of time that we have in his presence. But because by doing that, he's going to kill your spirit. He's going to kill your hope. And it's all related to the time we have in the presence of God. Give him space in your time. Dedicate time to be with the Lord. Give him space in your finances. How important is it to give God a room in your finances, that 10% to give unto the Lord? We could even give him room in our bodies through prayer and fasting. We can give him room in our minds through meditation. And we can give him 
time and our focus and attention. How important is it, church, to give God room? So it all starts with acknowledging that we have the ability to control some things. Just like the Shunammite woman, we have the ability to build something for the, the servant of the Lord to abide in. And I'm going to show you through this story exactly what happens when you take that mental decision to build a space for the Lord. It doesn't stop there. You'll see the rewards that come, that come and keep coming. It doesn't, it doesn't stop with just challenges, but challenges and rewards and challenges and rewards when you give God his space in your lives. So she built this room, and, and one day in chapter 11, it says, One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room, he laid down, and he said to his servant Gehazi, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, Tell her that she, you've gone through all of this trouble for us. Now, what can I do for you? Now, Elisha was a well-known and respected person, and he had conduits to the king. So Elisha said, what can we do for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or maybe the commander of the army? What kind of favor can I do for you just by making this space for me. And I feel the Lord is saying to his church, I can do that and so much more. I can do so much more when you make the space for me in your lives. What is too big for me? Elisha said, I can talk to the king. I can talk to the commanders of the army to give you favor because you made a room for me. And you made a meal for me. God is saying to his church, if you were to just do that much, I could do so much more. We have to teach our next generation and this generation how important it is that we don't forsake that setting apart that little bit of time for God. Amen. He doesn't ask for a lot. He doesn't want your whole house. He just wants space to be with you. So she replied, I have a home among my own people. She didn't need favor with the king. She didn't need favor with the armies. She said, I have my home among my own people. What else do I need? So Elisha said, well, what else can be done for her? And Gehazi said, she has no son, and her husband is old. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her, and she stood in the doorway. And Elisha prophesied to her and said, about this time next year, you will hold a son in your arms. All because she built a room. The, she didn't need money or finances or favor. The one thing she was lacking was a family. And because she built this room, she got a miracle. I want to tell you, church, where the presence of God is. The power of God must also be when you make room for the Lord in your home and in your family. There is nothing too big or too great for him to do. He could heal your body when you build him a room. He can restore your finances when you build him space into your life. He can keep you. He can keep your family safe. And he can restore your family because you decided to renovate your, your mind space, to give God more space. But she said, no, my Lord. She objected 
to his prophecy. And he said, she said, please, man of God, do not mislead me. How many of us have that experience with the Lord? And a pastor, a preacher would say, you're healed. Believe it in the name of Jesus. We just had two, two um, healers come to preach to us. And, and so many people got that word of healing. And then doubt sets in. Don't mislead me. I've heard it before. I've gone to doctors and they told me, um, do this or do this regimen and, and then I'll, I'll bear a child or, or do this and, and I'll be healed. And nothing happens. Nothing works. She was human and she, she had the same reaction to Elisha. She said, no, don't, don't mislead me. Don't mislead me. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha said it would be. I believe somebody is able to receive their miracle just by allowing God to have his space in your lives. It might not take somebody laying hands on you or or giving you, putting oil on your forehead. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes you can achieve your miracle just by the Holy Spirit being in you. When, when I started speaking in tongues, nobody was laying their hands on me. I was in my room praying by myself, and it just started flowing out of me. Sometimes it could just happen when you give God that space to be and dwell in, in you with your spirit. Give the Lord room. Give him some room in your time. Give him some room in your mind. So the child grew, and one day he went out to his father. Now this is where I want you to hear it. The child grew up. He was outside working in the yard with his father. And then he started to cry, my head, my head. Now this is something I would fear for my life. His father told a servant, carry him up to his mother. The servant lift up the boy, carried him to the mother in the house, and the boy sat on her lap until noon, until he stopped breathing. And he died in her lap. So what does this mother do? This miracle that God has done in her life, the only thing that she lacked, the only thing that she needed, dead, gone, destroyed, that would have absolutely broken me. That would have absolutely destroyed me. But I want you to come up in verse 21 and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door. Now, Elisha was not even there, but she took her child to the place that she built for the Lord. How do we do this in our own lives? A lot of times, a lot of us feel like what God has blessed us with got destroyed. You might have been blessed with a house in your past, and then tough financial situations came upon you, and you felt pressure, and you felt like you were about to lose that house, and you felt like God had once blessed me with this. I prayed about it, and he blessed me with it, and now he's destroying it. It's gone. Maybe it was a job that, that God, you felt God bless you with. You felt he, he led you into this position. He led you into this place. You prayed about it, and you sought after what he wanted. And when, when you prayed about it, he blessed you with this situation. And now it's falling apart. It's a place of toxicity, and it's something that isn't working for you. And you felt like what God once blessed you with is now being destroyed, what do we do in those situations? Maybe it was a relationship that we prayed about 
And we, this marriage, we, we came and we did everything right. We did our vows before the Lord and everything was great. But now, years and years in, it's falling apart. Something that God had blessed you with in the past is now being destroyed. And it's sitting in your lap and you don't know what to do. Well, I'll tell you what to do. Take it to the Lord. You have this, this place that you have built for God to abide in your space. Take it to the Lord. And that's exactly what she did. She took it up to his room and laid him on the bed. And then what she did is she went to find Elisha. She ran as fast as she could. She went as quickly as she could. And it was against the rules that she should have gone to Elisha because it was not, uh, it was not the Sabbath, nor was it the new moon that it says in verse 23. So she went against traditions and customs to get to the word of the Lord. And Elisha saw her and knew something was wrong. She didn't even have to say it. And Elisha ran as quickly as he could to the house. And long story short, he goes into the room and he prays over the boy and he stretches him out. And the boy's body becomes warm, and he sneezes. The Bible says he sneezes seven times. I think that's why I'm having allergy issues this morning. <laughs> sneezes seven times, and he comes back to life. Now, this room that once was a place just for, for a, a place for God to be present in their house, in their home, now this room represented resurrection the same room that they built now represented resurrection they could always go back to that room and see what god what i thought was destroyed you brought back to life that that financial situation that i thought i was done in God, you brought it back to life. That relationship that I thought was gone, Lord, you brought it back to life. We serve a God with resurrection power. He did it before and he will keep on doing it. Day after day after day, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. If he's a God of resurrection power in the days of Elisha, and he's a God of resurrection power while we, he was hung on the cross, he's the same God with resurrection power today and tomorrow. In the name of Jesus, what you think might be destroyed, bring it to the room, church. Bring it to the room. Jesus. Room for resur resurrection. God, I give you room right now in this place. God, I give you room right now in this service, God. Just start resurrecting some things in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we just lean into your presence, oh God. We lean into your presence and your power right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for your resurrection power right now, oh God. God, in the name of Jesus, we just bless you, Lord. Do your work, Holy Spirit. The story continues. You have to flip four chapters ahead. In chapter 8, verse 1. After that happened, after the boy was resurrected, Elisha said to the woman whose son had restored to life. That's what the word says. He says, go away with your family and stay a while wherever you can because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven 
years. God, I built a room for you to stay in. You blessed me with a son. Then you put me through the experience of losing a child. You brought him back to life, and now you're telling me I have to leave my home. I have to leave everything that I've built, everything that I've put together for you. You won't protect me through a famine? I have to lose and leave everything. Before, before she said, I have a home amongst my family, my people. I have to leave my people, my community, the things that I'm comfortable in and go into a land that I don't know. Why would God put us through this? Why would he do this to us? I believe some people in this church might be going through a similar situation where you've seen God's goodness and his hand in your life, but now you're feeling like he's gone, he's left you in a deserted place, in an abandoned situation, far from your home, far from your comfort, far from our normal routine. So the woman proceeded, as he said, she took up her family and went away to, and stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven years. Now I want you to hear what happens. After that seven-year period, the, um, Elisha, or Gehazi, Elisha's servant, was speaking with the king. And they were telling stories, and they were in the, in the throne room, and he was telling them the story of how Elisha brought this boy back to life. This is seven years later. Telling him the testimony of what God did to the king. While he's telling him the testimony, the woman and her son come back after seven years into the king's room. And Gehazi can't believe it. He says, king, this is the boy that Elisha, I was just telling you about. This is the same boy. Look, your testimony of yesterday might just be the keys that God is going to use to bless you with tomorrow. Stand on your testimony. Remember it. Remember what God did for you. Remember his goodness. Remember his mercy. Remember his power that he had over you and your family. Remember what he blessed you with. Because you might have been going through a famine and you might have lost everything. But that testimony is going to be the key to God's blessing in your tomorrow. He was telling him the testimony, telling him the king. They walked in the room and he said, look, this is the boy, Elisha, restored to life. How amazing. So they brought their request to the king and said, my land has been lost. While I was gone, it was taken over. And I want to hear what. I want to show you what he said in verse, uh, verse 6, chapter 8, verse 6. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including the income from the land from the day they left until now. I believe God's favor. I believe God's favor is coming to his people. Whatever you have lost, whatever you have lost, church, when you give God space, he is able to restore when you give God space, he is able to resurrect. When you give God room, he is able to restore. 
Come on, it's renovation time. It's renovation time. Let's give God space in our church. Let's give him space in our home. Give him space in your mind. Let him turn it around. I don't know what famine you've been going through. But my God is bigger than it. He is the provider. He can cause manna to fall from the sky day after day after day. He can feed you with nothing but the breath from his lungs. For I don't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord in the name of Jesus. We declare restoration over your church. Room for resurrection. Room for restoration. In the name of Jesus, church. Give God some praise. Give him praise. Jesus. As I close, I'm just going to pray over you. In the name of Jesus, God, we acknowledge your word, oh, Father God. We acknowledge your word. It's written in your word. It's nothing I say, God, but it is your word. And you are the word, oh God. You are the logos. Holy Father, we pray over every believer under the sound of my voice. In the name of Jesus, every situation that they're going through, God, we subject it to your throne right now in the name of Jesus. And we pray, God, for resurrection and restoration. We pray for a resurrection of hope and a restoration of your life. God, we pray for your spirit to move in each and every one of us, oh God, that our testimony would not just last for a day, God, but year after year, it would be a reminder of your power and your goodness. You are the same God. You are the same God, and you're able to do it again in the mighty name of Jesus.